Um, welcome to our, the last day of Fatal Bookmark. Um, we are extremely happy to have, again, Twice Told Tales, our morning session that we had also the last four days. Um, we were extremely excited, or are extremely excited to launch this new series um, of intim intimate translation readings. Um, so authors and translators get together and they read from their works, the original as well as the translated work. Um, we had opened this series with a book launch uh, by Roberto Calasso, whose uh, book Arda was translated in Hindi. Then we had a reading with, uh, in Canada in English uh, with uh, Vivek Shambhak and Chandan Gauda. Then the next day we had uh, a reading with Sukrita Paul Kumar and Baichan Patel in English, Hindi and Urdu. And today we have a reading with Nandana Dev Sen and Upali Uparachita reading in Bangla, Odia and English. So as you can see, we have quite a few languages uh, that uh, we cover in, in this session. Um, so as I said, today's, um, today's session will be with Nandana and with Upali. And we will start off, I'll introduce both of them quickly. Um, and then we will start off with Upali, and in the second half we will turn to Nandana's uh, poetry of her mother and so on. So uh, Nandana is a writer, actor, and child rights activist. Uh, she has authored three children's books, Not Yet, uh, which was just launched in eight bilingual editions, and which she also translated into Bengali, Mambi and the Forest Fire, and Kangaroo Kisses. She has three more forthcoming in 2017, and writes a fiction series for The Wire titled Youthquake. Nanda Nanda has starred in over 20 feature films in multiple languages and works with children and grown-ups at Rahi, Operation Smile, and UNICEF to fight against child abuse. After studying literature at Harvard and filmmaking at UC USC, Nanda worked as a book editor, screenwriter, a translator, a child protection, protection advocate, and as Princess Jasmine in Disneyland. Um, on my right hand side, I have with me Opali Oparachita. She's a distinguished fellow at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Carnegie Mellon University and a senior parliamentary advisor on international affairs in <coughs> India. She's also an internationally renowned classical Odyssean Paratananyam dancer and choreographer with uh, performances in 44 countries. Uh, Amritara Santana, the dynasty of the immortals, is her first translation, and she's already working on another one. Um, as I said, I would like to start off with Upali, um, and I think it's important to better understand the translation to also give a quick uh, bio of uh, your, your parents' background, because you did the translation together with your parents. Um, so on the one hand, there is uh, Professor Bidu Pusan Das, the primary translator, uh, he was a public intellectual, educator, administrator, and a beloved and much admired teacher of comparative and English literature. Uh, he wi uh, wi was widely regarded as a maker of modern Odisha. It was because of his friend Gopinath Mohanty's personal request that he undertook uh, the translating, uh, translation of Amritara Santana, 640 pages long. So that is really like a massive work of translation into English as a true uh, labor of love. He was educated at Harvard, Columbia, and Christ Church College, uh, College, Oxford University, and his hundreds of students became legends even during his lifetime. Then on the other hand, uh, there's your mother, uh, Professor Prabhat Nalinidas. She's a much admired and distinguished teacher of uh, comparative and English literature who has had a brilliant career across India. Uh, she was a star student of Murray Kruger at the University of Minnesota and was inspired to translate by him. Her translations have been published by Oxford University Press. She invited Gopinath Mohanty as a distinguished visiting professor when she was head of the department at Utkal University. And like her husband, she is fluent in six languages and can translate easily across four languages. So there was uh, a team of translators <laughs> working on this massive uh, uh, project, so to say. And I would ask you, maybe you can give the audience some background about uh, Mohanty's work to just un better understand what we are talking about here, um, like what, what makes this project so, so special to you and also to your parents and also for other people. All right, good morning. 
because time is not on our side. I'm going to be brief. Gopinath Mahanti uh, after Fakir Mohan, Mohan Senapati, that is chronologically, uh, is the most important writer in Odia. He wrote 24 novels and uh, 10 collections of short <coughs> stories. And uh, he also wrote a grammar of the Kandhas, the tribes about which he wrote. He wrote two books of grammar about them. Um, he was the first ever recipient of the Sahitya Academy uh, Award in 1955 and won the Pete Award. And then, of course, awards came his way a dime a dozen. Uh, he was a remarkable human being, a close friend of both my parents. And uh, this particular book, which is, as uh, Christoph said, 640 pages long, is really a labor of love. It took my late father, my mother, and myself 20 years to do it. So it is a cumulative effect, uh, effort of three people over to, uh, 20 years. My father passed away, and then really because daddy had done most of the stuff in his hand, uh, it was very, um, it was, it, it was time-taking, but extremely rewarding to do this. In uh, Gopinath Mahanti's opinion, this is his major work. I mean, his most important work. He's re written other works which are equally brilliant, but he liked this most of all. And so it was very touching that he sort of entrusted it to my father to be translated. This is about the Dongria Kandha, the very endangered tribe in Niamgiri, uh, which is being um, exploited for aluminum by mining com companies around the world. So the relevance of this book is even more enhanced in, in the political and sociological and anthropological climate of today. Um, that's all I, I have to say about him, and we're going to read from the book, and you know the book will speak for itself, the world's world. Um, anything else you wanted to ask me? Yes, uh, definitely. I wanted to ask you, I mean, this one is translated into English. Yes. Uh, are there, I mean, the, the original language is, uh, Oria. it's Oriya. Yeah. Are there any other translations into other languages available? Of, of his work, no. No. Okay, so then, so you think it was really a very important first step to actually have it translated into English? Yes, and that's what he wanted because it will naturally reach, uh, you know, wider audience. Okay, fantastic. And can you tell us a little bit more because I think that is a, a thing that is uh, applies to both of you. Um, um, how, how how was it for you to work together so closely with with your parents on that? Uh, probably one of the most rewarding things in my life. Uh, I worked less with my, my father because he was doing it on his own, but then we had requests from a journal in, in Berkeley to come up with you know, some of the stuff uh, in, you know, succinctly, and we did uh, send that to him. So that was the extent of it. Uh, the, major, uh, the major portion of the work has been with my mother. And uh, well, you know, I mean, it's always a very humbling experience to work with. As I said, she <laughs> translates very fluently across four languages, and she never strikes out hardly anything. Um, negotiating the intimacies of the language, um, I, I'd like to quote from Derrida here, because Derrida said, you know, in the act of translation, you know that you experience the, the fact that you can't really translate everything. There is a space there that you know is untranslatable. And unless you've experienced that, you've not really translated. And, and we, uh, we discuss that a lot, and you know, it's possible for you to get stuck with trying to make it too perfect. So there was a point at which she just told me to let it go, but that also was because she has complete faith in my capabilities, however limited they are. Mm. Uh, but at every stage, because she knew Mahanti very well, I think that's what's so special. Now, people have translated two of his other major works, uh, Poraja, which has been published by Faber and Faber, but which he wasn't happy with because they abbreviated it. Mm. But you know, they wanted to get it out. I think it was important for it to, you know, get out there, and it's been on the school syllabus. And uh, we have another translation on the anvil. Okay. Let's see another very major work, which won the Gyan Beat Award. So I hope that doesn't take twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, with mummy, I'm working with my mother. I think uh, for me, what what's been exciting and at the same time intimidating but in a good way is that she can come up with it and it's back and bang right there. Mm -hmm. Don't need to, she would, you know, it's perfect the first time around. Uh, but also her great feel for language and life as it's lived when 
when she reads uh, certain portions even now, in the original Odia, she has tears in her eyes. Mm. So do I. Mm. I mean, this is a very powerful, it's an echo. Mm. And uh, no amount of theorizing or talking about it in, in theory can do justice to its greatness. Mm. So. Okay. Maybe we can have like a glimpse of uh, the, the work. You, you yes. brought some passages with you in English and also in Odia, you said, yes, right? Yes. In Odia, in English, just tell me how much time exactly I have because I don't want to quote on Nandana and then we're also short of time here. Maybe you, so could, you said you have a 10 minute passage. So that would be. Yeah, the beginning that, and the end. Yeah. The end of chapter in Odia also. Yeah. It's about. Uh, I don't think you need the microphone if you don't want to be it's going to make it harder for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank That's you for right. me. Okay. All right. This is this is uh, the protagonist of, of this novel is a woman. She's uh, a former woman. She's about 90 or 20 years old. But the, the very dramatic beginning is about uh, Sarabu South and the village chieftain. And uh, so you know. Um, in the habitat of the unending line of his forefathers, harking back to the primordial past. In a Bongo village, at a height of 4,500 feet, in the Mara area, stands the house of Sarabu Santa. He is a Kanda. His language is the very primitive Kui dialect. His totem is the Miniaka, the name of that ancient corn grown on the slopes of hills. His village is Miniapayu. Sarabu Santa is the village ancient, the head of the village, almost the summum bonum of the village. Hence, he is the Santa. In his land, there are 500 Kanga families, and he, Sarabu Santa, is the crowning jewel to many houses of the tribe. He is not the king but the subject. However, he is the headman of the Kanga as their Santa. He wears a loincloth, his coppery hair flies about, thick and disheveled. From his mouth, the spittle trickles without end. Even so, he is the chieftain, empowered by his subjects to bestow life and death. Then, uh, in the brilliant sunlight of the last part of the month of Pausa, Pausa, eight-year-old Sarabu Santa sat leaning against a sala tree in front of his doorstep, gazing at the surrounding vistas and dreaming. Two long rows of houses facing each other in the village were the boundaries of this estate. However, that was not all. As his fancy spread its wings, there arose before him the peaked hills, obscured by shimmering veils of mists in countless waves with dales and caverns below them. All of them had belonged to his forefathers. Looking at the Mara forest, Sarabu Santa wondered if he might be born again. The Mara land was very beautiful, very beautiful indeed, with multicolored hills and crystalline streams. Elsewhere, there was an abundance of Odyssey flowers, linseed flowers. The Odyssey honeybees were busy dangling honeycombs on branches and walls. There was an all pervasive enchantment here. Christoph, how much time? Five minutes more? Okay, so let me uh, read, uh, you know, uh, the, the very final chapter. It's I will read it in Odia, and then in English. I also want to share something with you, which I already shared with Christoph. This is Gopinath Mahathir's own translation, and it's very on handwriting. And he tried and he said, well, you know, my, he was a student of English. And then that's, at that at point, he came to my father. He said, I don't think I'm able to translate faithfully, so would you please do it? So this is very precious. It is very precious. Sahe Ik, 101. Pajeda Patukai. Pila Kubuche Muche. Puyo Tia Hela. Disari Gare Soi Chanti, Nua Jibonar Samasya Heni, Chahati Asuchi Pahanti. Kandara Pade Katha, Mora Tumati Mananahi, Tapare Aukan Rahila, 
कि स्वार्थ तार ये गाँव लोके उठे झिंजट पड़े कहार तलिया हो रही टीपी चढ़े रसा अच्छी पिंपुड़ी अच्छी आधार रहा थान ना रात चेहरा धरी कुला आखि आगे देशी गला दूर मड़ भितर मीटिंग गाँ बाप घर कांथ भूसुड़ी पड़ी के लोक मरी हजी गले तथा मोर बोली कह गांधी से महाबली पर्वत सेमती ठिया चंपा बही जा मानी रघु सांता बुढ़ा आदर से गोटे नब के बुझ कि न बुझ धर्तनी कोड़े सबुरी झी अच्छी चिंता दिदिन जन्म तापर्तन एतिक बेल कटे हेब ना ठीक कही दिशारी मरण ना दुख ना ओह पड़ा तरतर हो चल लगला चल लगला किंतु ए कौन कौन हो जाग नुआ दुनिया जेत दम्भ कर धरले प्राण भितर थरी जाठ कंपी जा आखिर लुह केरा केरा हो बही पटि पशी जा उद्यान सूर्य को चाह निठे मने मने कही लगी जीवन रे स्वाद अच्छी Dawn was breaking. Puyu got up to stand, caressing and consoling the child. The Disarees are asleep. Everyone is asleep. Dawn was sprawling out with the problems of a new life. The Kondha has to say just once, "I do not fancy you." What remains after that? What then binds her to this village? People will wake up. Matters will get complicated. Should she remain subservient to anyone? A little sparrow has a nest. An ant has its feed. Would she be lacking in shelter? The night's resolve took shape and rose in front of her eyes. She vis visualized far away amidst the marshes, meeting village. The walls of her father's house had crumbled. Many of the old folks were dead and gone. Yet. She had the name of the village to call her own. The same old Mahabali hill stands, holding its head characteristically high. The Champa Jhara River flows on in the same way. The self-respecting Raghu Santa would welcome her gladly. Bubuli would understand, even though no one else would. Everyone has an appointed spot on Dhartali's lap, that is Mother Earth. This. Our life on this planet lasts for a mere two days. Then again, a transmutation follows. Is it not possible to buy these few days? The disarray was right. There was no death, no sorrow. She descended and continued to walk on briskly. But what was this? What was going on? A new era, a new world. No matter how strong you try to be. Your insides churn, your lips quiver, and the tears stream into your mouth. Gazing at the rising sun, she silently continued reciting to herself, resolutely. Life has zest in it. There is no death, no sorrow. Wonderful in both the languages, and I think that's the beauty of this session to hear also 
both the languages, I think that makes it so special. Um, I would like to turn to Nandana now. Um, hearing another lang language apart from English, in your case it's uh, Bengali, right? Um, and in your case it's also important, as important it was for you, uh, to quickly introduce uh, your parents. I would also like to introduce your mother quickly. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, she needs no introduction, but I still do it. Nabanita Dev Sen is one of the most beloved, versatile, and prolific writers in Bengali literature, equally expressive in poetry and prose, fiction and nonfiction. She has over 80 books in print in Bengali, including collections of poems, novels, short stories, travelogues, plays, humor, narrative nonfiction, literary criticism, and children's literature. Educated in Calcutta and the US at Harvard, Berkeley, Indiana, and Sharapur universities, and Presidency College, Dev Sen is an equally acclaimed international scholar with a long tenure as professor of comparative literature. Her many literary honors include the Padmash Padmashri Sahitya Academy Award, Bangla Academy Lifetime Achievement Award, and Lifetime Achievement Award of the Publishers and Booksellers Guild. Dr. Dev Sen is founder and president of the West Bengal Women Writers Association, SOI. So uh, you've taken up the poetry uh, uh, of your mother and translated it into uh, English. And uh, I think I would also like to ask you about uh, the relation with your mother. And, and I, you have a, a little essay with you, um, which perfectly explains, I think, uh, what the relation of you to your mother is. And you said you would like to read this essay out uh, to the audience. No, I guess I don't. Okay. Available in English, although visionary publishers like me, she has been trying to write that for a long time. Um, but so I decided, and, and there's a great demand for her writing, especially her poetry, in India and also internationally. Um, so this was my gift to her for her 17th birthday, and it's the one that I wrote um, for her. It's called Daughtering Beauty. My first semester in college. She arrived in between her conferences, suitcases and admirers in tow. Refusing abundant offers of hospitality in Cambridge, she shared and immediately redecorated the one and a half rooms assigned to my roommates and me. Every morning, she stood in line in our noisy dormitory to claim her three minutes in the shower. She preferred the modern steel and glass shower stalls opposite our room to the quieter, more old-fashioned bath down the hall. She left after a week, just as I was getting used to finding her hip-length hair in my comb, and turning every head in the 1,000-strong freshman uni, where she swept into dinner with me, gliding in like a queen, like she always does. A few weeks later, we hit midterm exams. I overslept the first day, found the showers occupied, and sprinted to the other bathroom in panic as I stumbled onto freezing tiles and fiddled with the cranky knob that spurted cold water for red and boiling for blue. Something miraculously familiar caught my eye. A crimson dot of velvet on the narrow gray wall. Her well-traveled bingley, carefully transported from her forehead and placed beyond the reach of the spray. <coughs> in a flash, I could hear her laugh and smell her scent. I could feel the tension in my neck melt into the mist surrounding me. That perfect circle of red gave evidence on the mildewed wall of her always being there, far away, so close. Hell, eternity, poem, jador, treasure, happy, forever and ever. Why do her favorite perfumes always seek to talk about her? And yet, no matter which one she wears, she always smells wondrously the same. It's that essence of mom, that adjective defying all too familiar fragrance that lingers in her sari before it's washed, that seeps out of her suitcase as soon as, as soon as she opens it, that greeted us every evening along with her whistled coat as 
as my sister and I raced each other down the stairs to let her in after work. She would be awake for hours each night after we went to sleep, correcting tutorials, completing conference papers, finishing a meeting, <coughs> writing a poem. I never knew when she came to bed, but even in my dreams, I'd get a whiff of that ma smell when she vigorously rubbed Nivea on our sleep-heavy faces. Last night, last year, I pulled out a big blue book from our Kolkata chef, 365 bedtime stories. When I opened it, out fell a red gold rush of leaves, oaks, <coughs> maples and ferns collected in London when I was a toddler. We had gathered them together in the woods at the bottom of the hill where we lived. One night, as she was reading to me about Tinker Bell, I had <coughs> turned to Ma with a technical question. What are fairy wings made of? Butterfly wings? Bird feathers? Or huge flower petals? There are all kinds of fairies, you see, Ma replied, just like there are all kinds of people. Do all fairies look like you? I persisted. I don't think so, she smiled. Fairies are very, very beautiful. But Ma, I protested, you're the most beautiful person in the world. She laughed, much more loudly than Tinkerbell, as she drew heavy curtains over French windows. Every little girl believes that about their mother, don't you? Well, Ma, I've grown up a bit. My world has grown up a lot. I left home as a child and made beautiful friends who became my family. In my work, I've met many beautiful faces, walked with beautiful figures. I've fallen in love with beautiful minds. You've grown up too. More books published, more awards won. More world tours, some with me, when we disagreed on everything. A few more panic attacks about your stubborn daughters. Around your eyes, a few more lines, celebrating years of full-throated joy. And we fought. I've cried when you haven't understood. I've begged you not to nag. I've yelled at you when I was upset with another. I've watched with panic as tears welled up in your ever adolescent eyes. <coughs> but I am as sure today as I was that night in London that even if you had not been my mother, even if that most precious accident of birth had by rights been the beginning of someone else's story, even if I'd met you in any of your other roles, as a poet, professor, painter, friend, or a stranger on a tram, you would still be the most beautiful person I could ever have met. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, <coughs> has you, I mean, you have, the, it was a birthday present, the translation of the poems yes. uh, in Make Up Your Mind. Um, has the translation changed your perception of your mother's poems, or has it? How is it to have it in yeah. a different language? No, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing, uh, it's, it's a great question. It's, it, uh, it hasn't changed my perspective of her poetry, but it sort of uh, it made me understand her life in a way that I hadn't understood before. I mean, I'd read all the poems before, but when I read them all together, because I was deciding which poems to translate, it was as if I was reading a, a journal, and I could she, she uh, uh, dates her poems typically. So I knew what was happening in her life, and it was as if I had, had access to these uh, short and very pure histories in her life that I, that I hadn't been aware of before. And it made me understand uh, her loneliness. It made I could see when she was in love. I could understand much better the separation between my, my mother and my father. Not because she wrote about any of them specifically, but it was very clear. It made me also understand the uh, very close and intimate, but also conflicted relationship she had with my grandmother, who was also a poet and who was an extremely ambitious and, and brilliant poet, but was before her time and had also always wanted my mother to achieve what she had not. So it was, uh, there was a lot of energy in that uh, that was sometimes troubled. It made me understand that. It also made me remember 
it, it brought me back memories of us uh, together when I was little. Not because, again, the poems were about me, but there's a lovely poem that she wrote about the first rains. And I suddenly remembered something that I hadn't thought of for years, which is that we had this ritual of whenever the first rains would come, we would go out onto the terrace and dance. We would just go out and get wet in it, you know? Um, so it did uh, make me feel even closer to her. Uh, and then I was actually doing it as a surprise, so I was very far away. I was translating it in, in Spain and, and in England and in New York, uh, and it was sort of this, uh, you know, uh, this overwhelming feeling of really wanting to talk or hug, but I, but I was far away, and I, I and it was a secret. So it, it was a, it was a very nice experience, and it was very emotional. So a lot of love in the in the book, like right? because you were so far away, you yes. kind of put every, all your energy <laughs> and all your wishes to be close. Yeah, I was nervous also because I wanted her to like the poems, of course. Because if you're translating something together, or you know, if she knew, I would have said, "What do you think? Is this is this does this sound right?" Like you work with your mom, mm -hmm. I couldn't do that because it was a surprise. So I was definitely a bit nervous about it as well. But she loved them. So. Wonderful, and. Um, I mean, in your own works, you you just we just talked about that your uh, your newest publication is in eight bilingual yes. versions. So that apparently languages and and yeah and translation seems to be an important topic for you. Yes, it Can is. you just briefly explain us why why is it so important for you to work in different languages? Well, there. I mean, I part of it is that I grew up um, being able to read. Um, of course, into like all of us, most of us grew up being able to read in these two languages, which more and more children are not able to do. Any anyone, I feel very, very strongly about that. I think children growing up in the cities, uh, learning in in English, are getting increasingly distanced from their mother tongue. I feel very strongly about it. That was one reason why I did this. Personally speaking, I also got fell in love with poetry because I had the uh, set of these fantastic uh, Penguin Modern Poets series, where, which were bilingual, several of them were bilingual. I, that, that series doesn't exist anymore, although I understand the Modern Poets series is coming back in different form. <coughs> but that's how I started learning Spanish, was from uh, Pablo Neruda's 20 poems and a song of despair, because it had you know, short poems and you could uh, get a sense of what the language was like. So I was sort of fascinated by uh, bilingual books from an early age. And I, I do also think uh, that so much of our work, the best of Indian work, gets written in vernacular languages. And we don't have, tra and we haven't managed to prioritize translation as an art form in the way it has happened in the other countries. And there are a lot of uh, publishers who do see it as a priority, as a publisher, as are there a couple of others who do. but. Uh, it's difficult to find translators because what happens, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Urbashi, that a lot of the times the writers who are very, very good at language want to write original work rather than translations. So the translations still are seen as here, as not as opposed to a, a, a unique art form in itself. Um, Tess, would you agree that there is still a bit of a yes? Absolutely. Tess is a. a very celebrated French translator. So I think because of that, I feel uh, that we need to, I mean, there is it become better. It's better now than it was 10 years ago. But I think we do uh, uh, need to do a lot more in India to uh, cultivate a culture, a kind of a, a sort of esteem for uh, translation so that we have more translators who can then make our great literature available to the rest of us because we can't even read other, uh, you know, wonderful literatures written in other parts of the country. And I think I feel very strongly about that. But then on the other hand, I mean, my experience is that I teach at Pune University, I teach German literature, and uh, the students there are MA students and they perfectly speak German as well as like three, four, five other Indian languages, including English, of course. Um, so I have the feeling in India, the situation of multilingualism is fantastic in comparison to other countries. I think it depends on where you are. Yeah. See, 
you're in a in a in a student community yeah. that's quite active. They are in a German program, so of course they know German. Yeah. Um, I mean, usually uh, kids will, and they have studied English, so of course they know that. They have a mother tongue, and they probably, which is Marathi, so and then they have Hindi. But that is a, but you're not in not every city you find yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, in Calcutta, where I grew up, now kids speak more Hindi than they did when I grew up. But you know, there was really only Bangla and English. If you went to an English medium school, if you went to a Bengali medium school, you knew English, but you were terrified of speaking it. You know, I went to a school that was somewhere in between. It was, uh, it was a technically English medium, but it was a called South Point High School, and it was, but nobody spoke in English, and we were still all terrified of speaking English. So you know, it was not the way that we communicated. But now, when you go to go to Calcutta, kids. Uh, Bengali kids can speak in English, but they don't know how to write it. They wouldn't know how to read this. Yeah. Okay, um, you've got some poems. You yes, I do. Uh, I do. Also, also works, right? From I do your, actually. your mother's work as well as your own work that you. Well, look, this is what's sweet about this is that it's my the book that I translated, but I translated it with my mother. What happened was I had asked her to translate it first, and she partly because uh, I mean I was. I knew I could translate it, and it wasn't that. It was sort of a sentimental decision because this book, which is a children's book, is a mother-daughter story. So I just thought it would be quite poetic if she would do she would do the translation. But then she didn't have time. She's she's a brilliant and also brilliantly scattered brain, as all the friends present here will know. So eventually, when I got the third call from Tulika, I said, "Fine, I'm going to do it." And I translated and I sent it off. They loved it. It sort of went to the uh, press and then the day after my mom says, says okay I've translated it now <laughs> so then we didn't actually change it very much because we'd, we'd already given it uh, but it was just sort of lovely that she had a version of it and I had a version of it and there were certain words that I took from her translation uh, because I felt very uh, just sentimentally I wanted her to I wanted this to, to have been done by both of us so um, it's just a, just one poem actually, which I will read to you. Um, but maybe I'll end with that. Before that, should I read a couple? How much time do I have? Uh, we have, because I would also like to take some questions from the audience. So we, maybe you start off with uh, with your mother's work, and then you could actually yeah. end with yeah. not yet. So maybe five minutes, five minutes, really. five minutes, minutes. So then I won't read too much in Bangla. How many of you here speak Bangla? No Bangla. I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think everyone wants to hear. Okay, okay. I, I could understand a lot of what you were saying actually because there it's so close. Okay. So she's written a lot of poetry. Um, one of the there's some recurring themes themes in her poetry. She writes a lot about both the healing power of language and also the destructive power of language. This is something that I'm fascinated with. Uh, by in her poetry, she doesn't do that in her prose, but in her poetry, she is very concerned about this um, about, about this conflict. So I'll read a couple of poems that are about language and poetry. Um, so this one I read it with Mangla. Joto kal kobita, peche thako, pute thako, amok passport koye. Sorry, peche thako, pute thako, amok passport chobi koye. Protek line to Mizegetako. A con to Teshtar Motun, Chati Pata John Trona Amar, Kutetako, Luki Tekona, Jotokal, Kurita, Master. In poetry. Stay alive. Show yourself clearly, like an unfading passport photo. Stay awake in every line. You, like an unquenchable thirst. Yes, you. The pain that tears my heart apart. Show yourself clearly, like a flower in full bloom. Don't hide from me as long as I live in poetry. Excuse me, if you could read the other one first in English and then in Bangla, maybe we will be able to enjoy that. You think, you think that would be better? Okay, yeah. that's, a, yeah. that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll read another one that's about the. Uh, this one more, was more about coping through language, uh, healing and surviving through poetry. This one has a slightly different perspective. So let me read that. <coughs> um, 
Borrow, no, so you said English first, right? Growing up lesson. Boy, are you scared of bloodshed? Are you terrified of bucking virginity? If the taste of blood goes to your head, you fear it will be a total calamity? The truth is, whether wrong or right, your blood calls out to you each night. Listen, boy, it's time for you to grow. Words can be as fierce, don't you know? The treachery that lingers on tongue tips, beyond the words that all your dreams show, know that blood can be easily shed by lips. Boro hawar part. Rokto bate bhoi paash chhele? Gomar jo haro ne bhoi paash? Akbar rokte shat pele uchi shorbo naash? Chash bana chash. Toke rokto nitto nishi dake taani. Chhele? Tumhe boro hoye hojo. Jano na to okkoro kato hinsro gote paare? Jeeva kato chotu rali jane shokno para paare? Ki rokto jwara te paare? Maybe you could have one more and then also the one from, from no, your no, book no. and then I would like to open up for some questions. Okay. Maybe I'll write and do... She's done a lot about... Uh, she's written a lot about the difficult choices that women have to make in terms of uh, multitasking, the identities that you have, that you have to negotiate between um, the perspectives that you have that are not the perspective that the others have. So I think I'll, I'll read a couple of very short quotes. And I won't read the Bangla maybe, I'll just read the English. I think that's the faster. This one is called The Acrobat. She thought she... She thought she knew acrobatics rather well. That she could juggle time with both hands, play with the now right next to the them. She would make both dance, she thought, fist to fist. And she would glide so smooth along the tight rope. She thought she could do absolutely anything at all. Only once in your life will that rope shiver. This one is called The Night of the Ring. Man, in the twilight, I could still hear the lark. Woman, the night was moonless, oppressively dark. Man, in the flowering woods, a night fairy walked. Woman, in the Sundar buns, the man eater stalked. Man, in that fragrant springtime air, woman, blood drenched remains lay there. You said you wanted to read yeah. the last one from not yet. Yes, yes I, I, that's it's very short. So um, I want this to be as close to the this is a children's book, so I want you to respond to it as if children like children would. <laughs> Which means that when you hear me say not yet, all of you need to say not yet. Okay. <coughs> and when you hear me say equina, all of you have to say equina, okay? Here goes. Can a frog stand on its head? My dear, it's time for bed. Not, Not yet! yet. Not yet. <coughs> 
I'm learning to fly with birds in the sky. Love, get back to land. Now let's wash your hand. Your clothes are a mess. Come, change your dress. Not yet! My hippos and puddles need sleeping puddles. I'll snuggle a whale and nuzzle her tail. I'll race alligator. No, chase him later. You've not touched your cup. Your milk, drink it up. Not yet! If I tickle giraffe, she'll giggle and laugh. I'll sing with my nose and dance on my toes. It's late, darling. Hush. Let's get your toothbrush. Not yet! First, I'll brush elephant's tusk. He's been waiting since dusk. Then I'll comb furry bear. Please comb your own hair. Not, Not yet. 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 Monkey needs a squeeze. She sleeps in those trees. Hear that clock chime? You know it's bedtime. But I must hug my pop. And I must tuck you up. Here's a kiss for kangaroo. How about a kiss for you? Yes! Right now! Ma, switch off the light? Yes, dear. Now, good night. I mean, do we have questions? So that's the point. If you have questions, we could take the questions. Otherwise, we could do the thing. Yeah, I think we can do the thing.